Hey, what's up? It's Mr. Bill here. Before listening to the podcast, I just wanted to plug my dates. I'm doing November 23rd at Bohemian Bee Freaks in Queensland, 30th in Sydney, December 12th in San Francisco, 13th in Nevada City, 14th in LA, 18th in Denver, 19th Meow Wolf in Santa Fe, 21st Columbus, Ohio, and January 11th in Philly. Go to my label, uh, thelegalbeats.bandcamp.com, listen to my shit. I'm going to release a new EP there pretty soon, and uh, yeah, enjoy the podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you are listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Hey, you're 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 listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Sick. All right. Welcome to episode 11 of the Mr. Bill podcast. Uh, I'm here with Jan, Zhu, and Brian Zadigan, and you're both hackers. I guess. I can't My, confirm or, nor deny that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> sure. Um, so my my podcast guy, Robert, who does all the editing, he's like, bro, your podcast is a sausage fest. You need to get a girl on and you also need to stop interviewing like just music people. What, what's up? Oh, no, I was, yeah. <laughs> we're recording in the middle of a bedroom in Melbourne and we are, we're recording at Jesse from Circuit Ben's house and, uh, something's going on outside the door. Dude, I hope those kids come back. The ones who are like screaming outside so you can yell at them. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they were just cheering on the music. <laughs> I think this might be the most, uh, we're up to episode 11 of this podcast and I'm already recording them from beds. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most ghetto shit. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do when you're traveling all the time and you want to do a weekly podcast. So, I don't know. Let's talk about, uh, we can't talk about music because, fuck, we always talk, I always talk about music on this podcast. Let's talk about other shit. Let's talk about hacking, even though I don't know anything about it. Well, we could talk about music. I mean, we did spend like the last 24 hours just cracking tunes out, but nah, hacking music's it is. <laughs> I, like, I like your, uh, I mean, from what I know, I pretty much everything I know about hacking is just from hanging out with you guys, but I like your um, concept of it or the way that you explain it where you're basically like hacking is just finding the instructions for a certain system and then just finding like weird little loopholes and stuff in this system. And like you, for instance, did that and were able to fly from dc to australia business class the whole way without it costing you business class prices basically right because you're a credit card or airline hacker i mean that's one way of putting it so uh, that's exactly right so if you take um if you take the world around you and you just kind of uh, break it down into its into the different rules that people make uh, then you find out pretty quickly that what you can do is you can find ways to work around each rule that somebody comes up with and it, with computer systems and Jan can talk to this in a second uh, with computer systems. This just means working around code and being able to get a computer to do something that it was never meant to do. Right. Um, now, if you're, let's say like an airfare hacker uh, or you, you know, hack rewards or things like that, are you, computer hacking are you like behind the screen with a hoodie over your head not so much but you're getting a lot of value out of a system that people didn't really think they could get um i it's fun uh there's another there's another aspect to it that we call social engineering it's basically just convincing people to give you things that you really want uh so one of my fun tricks whenever i fly anywhere is just being able to uh, upgrade the car that I have, upgrade the hotel that I have with like nothing, no effort. And just yet, by like asking basically. That's basically it. Um, there's a technical term for it, which we would call like asymmetric value. But basically it's, I find something that they want and like something that really matters to whoever I'm talking to. Um, and when I first started doing this, it was, I'd get liquor bottles uh, from, well, I probably can't say where I got them from, but like liquor from travels and I would actually give them to uh, like say the, the guy who would give me the car that I would rent. It's like two little bottles of Tito's or something. And they'd end up upgrading me like five or six levels yeah, right. just for that. And I did not spend, <laughs> I didn't spend $500 a day on a car. 
That's hacking right there. It's it's hacking. <laughs> you're just gonna hacking. you're just gonna keep hacking juice on you. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> AKA mini bottles of Tito's. Yeah, all the Tito's. <laughs> um, so that, this happened to my friend Evan Slink. Um, basically, somebody just like messaged him on his Facebook page, and they were like, "You need to." Oh, they didn't say you need to do anything, but they were basically like, uh, "We can pay you for ads like that we show on your page, but they won't like." actually get shown to your fans it'll just be dark ads running on your page yeah you just need to make us an admin of the page so we can like run the dark ads and then for every dark ad we run to like fan bases from your page we'll like pay you x amount of dollars to do that yeah um and then he like gave them admin access to his page and they immediately just removed him and all of his managers as admins and just took it took over his page exactly and for like 24 hours there was just like this weird thailand lady that kept coming up in videos trying to sell sunglasses on his page <laughs> <laughs> so that's like a I, I guess a form of hacking where it just literally took like talking to slink yeah and trying to make the deal seem sweet for him and then taking advantage of that right yeah they uh would we call that fishing yeah it was, it was i saw the screenshots of that um going on and it was actually it was definitely fishing like they actually made a page that looked deceptively like um basically they they found a way to modify some of the text that you could put on the facebook page to add someone as an admin to make it look like it was an official facebook request it's kind of like unclear that he was actually adding these people as admins to his facebook page you know the cool thing is we talk about like we'll say words like fishing or um there's a variant of it we'll call whaling which is basically you just go after like a high level ceo or something and these terms sound they they sound so far fetched they sound so beyond comprehension for most people it's really just, hey, how do I trick somebody and get them to do something that I want them to do? The way I do it is I give I give people things they want and hopefully they benefit. Everybody wins. Wait, but I, I wouldn't call that fishing though because you're not no, like, you're right. being deceptive to them. Whereas fishing is where you try to like hide the origin that someone's going to or hide like yeah. uh, like pretend to be a Gmail login page. No, you're absolutely right. So so it's it's multiple. I certainly wouldn't call what I do fishing. Mine is just mine is just social engineering, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but what you just described, uh, Bill is certainly an attack that one would call phishing. And where I want to take this is there are in pop culture, there are, um, there are some films that show this off perfectly. Uh, I want to say oceans eight did this recently. Um, if I remember the, the, the they had this one ha like this one hacker chick, uh, that, actually fished a security guard i think uh and that was just so well done it was so grounded and well done uh where the attacker the hacker girl actually uh constructed an email um that had fancy images and convinced somebody to click a link and it was it didn't use campy hacker lingo it didn't use anything crazy like that it actually showed exactly what a real life phishing attack would look like in a movie Right. Um, did you want to talk about the fact that you uh, do things for movies in that sense where you you uh, consult to try and you don't have to mention any names of movies or anything. But like, I think it's interesting that like one of your jobs is to go to Hollywood and talk to film people and then just be like, oh, that's a bullshit thing that would never happen. And like you basically consult on like hacking things in the film. Right. Yeah. So um, that's that's kind of a fun side gig. Right. So um, uh, I, I had an opportunity to speak at DEF CON once, and after the one talk that I gave, I was approached uh, to consult in uh, to consult on a number of projects, a number of film projects, to make hacking more realistic. Basically, to make hacking films less like hackers and more like Mr. Robot. Right. Uh, okay. Mr. Robot's probably one of the best examples, right? Right. Um, and they probably had like mad consulting for that one, right? Actually, yes. Yeah. Uh, what they would do for Mr. Robot is they would actually. Yeah, do you remember who actually consults on Mr. Robot? I mean, I do, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say. Yeah. But it's certainly like friends of ours who, yeah. who know what they're doing. Yeah, like they would actually replicate the exact, the exact hack. They would make it real um, just to make sure that what they were about to put on screen wasn't absolute garbage. They would like actually execute the hack that yeah. was going to be on Mr. Robot just to make sure it was possible. Yeah. They would, they would, <laughs> they would, yeah, they would do it. And then they would, and then afterwards, like, like Rami or wh whichever character was doing it would then walk through it, um, for the sake of the screen time. Would they like hack people that, uh, had sort of previously consented, uh, like allowing them to hack them or would they just like hack 
anything. So. so I can't speak to how they did it for, for that production, but for any productions I was involved with, um, the way it would be done is, well, the, the studio owns, or rather the company that they spun up just for the film owns all the assets. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, you're kind of just giving permission to yourself to hack your own demo systems, really. Right. Yeah, speaking of consensual hacking, um, would you say what you do, Jan, is white hat hacking? Because that's a thing I guarantee <laughs> many people listening to this podcast don't know as a term. Yeah, so in the like uh, security infosec community, we have these terms, I guess, white hat, black hat, and gray hat. And so white hat is people who hack for good. So for instance, um, finding security issues and then reporting those issues to companies so that they get fixed and they aren't left open for uh, other people to exploit maliciously and black hats are people who kind of want to exploit things maliciously and it's against their interest for systems to become more secure and the gray hats people who are somewhere in the middle of those two and do you know so, both kinds uh yeah i would say so i mean i'm definitely more in the white hat um defensive community like people trying to make the internet more secure um trying to get people to update their passwords and do all the like boring stuff but right yeah and, and would you say um from your experience uh seeing white hat hackers and black hat hackers and maybe potentially knowing some of both that there's like a fundamental personality difference between the two kinds of people hmm, yeah i don't know brian like would you say you've noticed people being yeah, I mean, I don't want to, like, play psychologist too much. I would say, like, a lot of people I know who are white hats are generally seem like nicer people. <laughs> I, I think I think that's a good take on it. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would slant it and say that um, when you decide you want to go after one particular path in your life. So when I was growing up, uh, I got into some trouble. Um, nothing big, but I got into some trouble uh, for breaking into different systems. Uh, but I had the right intervention with school teachers and that set me kind of on the right path. And I had a really good understanding of like, Hey, do I want to get in this kind of trouble? Um, I would, if I had to guess, I would say that if somebody wants to be a a white hat, they understand like a mission or they under, like they really, there's something that we're really aspiring to Um, uh, maybe making the internet a better place, a safer place, Um, maybe for people that we know or whatever. Um, But if you're operating more on the black hat side, there may be another motivation. Yeah. I mean, I I also think like one cynical way to look at it is just uh, like, what are you willing to do for like how much money? Cause part of me thinks like if you offer anyone like $10 million to just hack their friend or whatever, they'll probably do it. Right. Like they'll find some way of morally justifying things that they otherwise wouldn't do. (laughs) Right, you're saying if, like, the money's there, people will sort of, like, bend their morals or, like, try and justify it in some way? Yeah, and maybe some people wouldn't, right? But, like, everyone has a bending point, and some pe- for some people, like, that bending point is much easier than other people. True. Um, at this point, like, would you say there's maybe more money in white hat stuff anyway, or at least more, like, secure jobs in that industry? Uh, there, I mean, I certainly feel a lot of job security for people doing, like, defensive or white hat security. Like, um, what, yeah, what do you do if you're a black hat hacker? Wouldn't you be pretty much independent just working on your own at your house? Just- There's some crazy bug bounties. So bug bounties are where companies will pay money for people to find uh, exploits. And then, um, well, so I guess there's two kinds. There's one where the company itself, like Google or Apple, will pay people bounties for reporting security bugs. And then there's ones where like nation state hack- hackers, like the government, will pay for exploits in iOS so that they can, you know, target political dissidents and such. And on both sides of that, there's like quite lucrative bounties. I think Apple has, I want to say like a $10 million bounty for like um, the highest level of exploit in iOS, for instance. So what what would constitute the highest level of exploit? Uh, something like basic, like in practice would be like visiting a web page and then um, the attacker who is running that web page can get remote access to your phone, you know, track your location, run code on your phone. Ah, uh, so true. So, like the highest. Level. So, if I could go to Apple's website, somehow access your iPhone and run a script on it and show Apple that I could repeatedly do that to anybody's phone, they would give me $10 million? Uh, yeah, something like that. If you showed an employee on the security team at Apple that, you know, 
you have a web page and anyone who visits visits that web page just instantly gets their device hacked and you can run remote run your attacker code on their phone then i think yeah they would give you like a million or 10 million dollars or something crazy like that far yeah. i would i would say that the um the price difference um I don't remember the exact numbers, but like Google and Apple are certainly playing pretty high tier. Um, I don't remember if either of them have hit a million dollars yet, but to your point about nation state hackers, um, you have brokers that essentially buy bugs. Yeah. Like Zerodium. Yeah. Yeah. Like so Zerodium not- also pays on the order of like one to $10 million. Yes. I think. Zerodium a company. Yeah. So it's a company that like many people would say is more on the black hat side of things because they buy these vulnerabilities in Uh, products like apple products and then they sell them to customers and we don't necessarily know who those customers are but they aren't telling apple about these bugs so it's not in their interest for apple to like fix these security issues because they want to sell these is there Um, any like publicly known uh like instances of of them buying a specific bug and then doing malicious stuff with it or anything yeah so there was um i don't remember the name of the company um but there was a comp- there was the rather notable case of um, of an agency uh, trying to gain access to a uh, uh, to a suspected um, you know like a suspected suspected terrorist's phone, uh, and they were unable to break into it. And this actually started um, Apple's very public crusade for privacy. Uh, in the end, um, I think it was the FBI. Uh, they ended up going with a uh, with a third party company that said, "Hey, we have a way into this phone." And so, so Apple was trying to get into a terrorist phone. No, the FBI was doing it, and Apple was pushing back. Oh, the FBI was trying to get into a terrorist phone. The terrorists used an iPhone. Yeah, and Apple was like, "No, we can't give you their information, regardless of whether or not they're a terrorist." Yeah, it's like we can't help you gain access to this phone. Right. Um, it, the phone was locked, like it was locked out. I can imagine that probably would have stirred up a bit of shit in like the. All, all sorts of different communities of people yeah. sort of leaning on the side of no you should let them into your phone uh, you should you should let the fbi into the guy's phone if he's a terrorist versus privacy people who are like regardless you shouldn't that's that, i mean that that conversation really flared up but yeah. ultimately the fbi kind of sidestepped um if i remember correctly i might be butchering the de- details because it happened a few years ago but i think the fbi just sidestepped the entire conversation by just contracting the services of a company that had a vulnerability that somebody sold them, I presume, um, to break into that one phone that one time. And that service ended up costing some fierce amount of money. It might've been a million dollars just for a one-off job. So it was a company similar to Zerodium that sold the FBI uh, access to someone's phone like that? Yeah, that's. I think that that's what happened. Huh, interesting. Uh, And what was the result of all of this? Well, I don't think that, I don't know whatever happened to the actual investigation, but all the news died down um, after, uh, if I, again, if I remember right, all the news died down after the FBI finally gained access to the phone. Um, And, but that still began Apple's very public um, promotion of privacy as like a fundamental tenant of their business practices. And right, they were like the fact that anyone like even this third party company could could sell the data yeah to this uh, to the FBI as a problem for us because they wanted to pride themselves on their privacy or whatever I think so um but I mean if you want to look at if you want to look at what Apple's done with it now um and Jan might be able to speak to this a bit um because she's just more tied in with um some of Apple's product folks um I'm not saying like dump Apple's information and like don't do that um but well yeah, yeah it goes beyond just Apple I think there's uh there's been a many years debate over like what level of access are tech companies obligated to provide to the FBI, to the yeah. NSA, to, you know, really any government agency. And so <clears throat> some government folks would say like, because we want to stop terrorism and a lot of terrorist coordination probably happens on smartphones and via email and like all these, uh, channels of communication which tech companies control and could potentially monitor then these tech companies are obligated to give us access to their data so that we can track potential terrorists yeah but then tech companies will come back and say or like privacy advocates would say you know if you have access to this terrorist phone you could potentially access anyone's phone and so that kind of compromises privacy for everyone and so therefore um, just because there could be a terrorist doesn't mean we should turn over everyone's data. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, which side would you lean on? 
I'm definitely on the side of no, just because, you know, there's potential terrorism doesn't mean we should just like, build back everyone. doors in the, yeah. all these tech companies, et cetera. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? What side do you lean on? So um, I, I've kind of nuanced my own position on this. Um, this. Some of this might just be because of like past work and things that I've done. But um, my thinking here is that there needs to be a balance that's struck between privacy and security. And uh, when it comes to having strict access and breaking encryption, like basically baking in back doors mm-hmm. um, into devices or into how phones talk to each other or things like that, I'm like, Jan, I'm, it's a pretty strict no. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I would also say that if a government spends uh, their own resources to find ways around, around a security thing, like some security feature, they find a way to break into a phone. They find a way to crack an encryption algorithm to read that data. If they do that and they succeed at it, um, then you know what? That's the, the, to the victor go the spoils, right? Like that's, um, they invested that effort, that time, um, and they found it the hard way. Um, and that should motivate us as engineers, as white hats to, um, kind of invest the time to harden the systems. It's, it would be an arms race in a sense, but the idea is, Hey, we're building towards a positive future. Um, and if we're being perfectly frank, if a nation state, if a government really wants somebody, they'll get them. Like Mm -hmm. that's just, that's a foregone conclusion. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of hardened systems, let's speak about brave. Cause that's a, as far as I know, just a more hardened web browser, right? That, uh, I've been trying to get all my friends to start mm-hmm. using it. Any, anyone listening to this podcast, you should just get brave. Oh my just, God. Yeah. You should actually, Bill, you should make a referral code on brave. Cause we actually like, um, you can do this thing where if you refer friends to brave, that you can get like a small amount of, uh, tokens. We're doing that. Oh, totally. So you could probably have made like a hundred tokens by now. Oh, uh, you know what I'll do? I yeah. will uh, make a referral code for Brave, and I'll put it in the description of the Libsyn. Uh, yeah. Uh, description. Podcast. Yeah, on Libsyn, I'll, I'll put the put a whatever a referral link. Sick. And get all the tokens. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Fuck, yeah. I'm gonna be fucking rolling in tokens. Rolling in tokens. <laughs> nice. So loaded with um, tokens. Yeah. All right. So let's let's uh, explain why people should use Brave. Basically, from my perspective, it's faster, which like it's faster than Chrome, which was the fastest browser I'd used before that. Yeah. And I want to say I'm not paying Bill to say this because it does, it sounds like you're being paid to say it. But uh, you're not. I mean, I just I honestly just tell people all the time to get it because I like it so much. It's fine. I'll do it. I'll 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 say that I use Firefox to kind of balance out use the narrative. Firefox? Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> For what reason? Why didn't you use Brave? So I, I, this was a bit of like masochism on my part, but I've been using Firefox since before they made themselves really fast. Okay. Um, like I've been using Firefox since they were just absolutely just garbage slow. Right. Um, but for me personally, I'm so hooked into Google for everything that I was just like, look, I need something to counterbalance who sees all my data. Uh-huh. Um, and so I was just like, okay, Firefox it is. And um, that really, my decision kind of hardened when Microsoft, uh, poached some ex Google folks and then did, made a decision to kill like their browser. And so now even Microsoft's web browser is based on the technology that's in Chrome. Yeah. So I would say brave sort of tries to address that because even though we are code wise based on Chromium, which is like the open source Chrome project. Um, we really try hard to rip out all connections to Google. So if you download Brave, like it doesn't connect to Google by default. Mm. Obviously, like if you log into Google, then it's connected. But um, yeah, we try to not have the browser outside of web pages or outside of like cases where you're clearly saying like connect to Google. Um, we try to keep it separate. Yeah, I also that. don't think on this podcast we've even mentioned that you work at Brave yet. Yeah, I do. I've actually worked there for well. By the time this podcast come out comes out, it'll almost be my fourth anniversary at Brave. So You're four a brave years. OG. Yeah, I am. I think it was like six people when I started, and now it's about a hundred. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say like the way I would describe Brave is it's like Chrome without all the Google stuff, um, with some additional uh, additional features to kind of harden the security and privacy aspect. 
and right. with a micropayments platform built in, which we can talk about in more detail because that's kind of complicated. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to ask you, uh, Brian, you, you said you use Firefox. Do you do any extra things to it, like using plugins or changing defaults to, to make it less insecure? I. Yes. Um, so the easiest thing for anybody using Firefox, the easiest thing to do is use um, use Mozilla's containers plugin. Um, and that just, mm. it lets you, essentially what it lets you do is it lets you say, okay, all my shopping, I'm going to right click new tab open or like right click a link and say open in the shopping container. And like that way, if you start browsing as an example, Neiman Marcus, um, and you start browsing a whole bunch of products, then when you go to other sites while you're in, let's say, the work container, you're not going to see, let's say, a whole bunch of Neiman Marcus product ads, right? right. Um, I call them out specifically because that happened exactly once, and that's when I started using um, that's when I started using the containers plugin, and that one I think is written by Mozilla. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so the way that Brave solves this is just by like not sending any of your data at all to web pages, right? Yeah, well, so uh, yeah, it's a little more complicated. So we block third-party cookies. So when you go to a site, um, you know, cookies are used to keep you logged into Gmail, Facebook, whatever. Uh, they can also be used by tracking. So when you go to a site, we block cookies to any sites that aren't like the site that you're on. So if you're on Facebook and Facebook is loading like all these ads from Amazon, we won't send cookies to Amazon. So, um, you know, it's hard for Amazon to know that like you're on Facebook right now and uh, give you like targeted Amazon ads. We also just do like general ad blocking. Um, so like if you're using Brave, ideally you shouldn't see any ads. By the way, it's worth it's worth noting that so Jan, she definitely didn't hype up her role as much as I probably think that she could do. <laughs> um, but but when Jan says this stuff, when Jan describes Brave and how it functions in this way, you can like actually take her word on it. Um, just considering the amount of engineering that I've seen her do, like in the middle of a bar, she pops up a laptop and starts submitting a bug fix. Um, <laughs> and so like that's um, when she describes how it works, like I take her word for it. Honestly, less so these days. Cause like, yeah, like when Brave was six people, like I think everyone was just cranking on every part of it. But now that it's a hundred people, like I've been there so long that I kind of just like tell people what to do and then they do it, which is something we were talking about earlier. Like yeah. Bill was saying like, oh man, if I could only move into a middle management position <laughs> oh, in I'm music to, production, that'd be yeah, Fuck Ableton, I'm trying to move into middle management. <laughs> Which is something literally no one has ever said, like in the history of the world. Getting real sick of this fucking music shit. <laughs> it's pretty great. We've got two middle managers in the room right now. We can try and help you out. Oh yeah, move me up to middle management, bro. <laughs> <I'm into it. laughs> do you think like Dead Mouse and people like that do a lot of middle management or like upper management? Like, how much of their time is just spent telling other people like shit to do? I know when I hung out with him, he was like, "Oh, I just signed a contract with your name on it in regards to a remix. Is it good?" And I was like, you haven't listened to the remix I did of your tune that's coming out on your label next week? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, no, I haven't listened to it. He's like, I, did, I just signed the contract. What the hell? And I was like, fair enough. So, I mean, yeah, I suppose he does do a little bit of that kind of middle management stuff. Would, would you class that as middle management, signing a contract? I don't know the difference between middle and upper management. He's probably like upper management. That's like executive honest. decision making. To be honest, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's like... Yeah. Oh yeah. Fuck yeah. For the middle house. management would yeah. be that guy giving you Facebook jobs, right? Like yeah. That okay. Middle man. <laughs> yeah. Type stuff. Oh yeah. So just to like elaborate <laughs> on that a bit, um, I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast yet, but I write music for Facebook sometimes. Basically, this company hits me up and they, uh, they well, so the reason Facebook needs music is because they kept getting sued by people uploading videos with like you know songs by Snoop Dogg and shit under it. And then they were like, fuck, we don't want to keep getting sued and paying millions of dollars to these bigger artists. So they started this thing called the Facebook, I think it's called the Facebook Sound Collection. And then uh, just pay artists basically to make a bunch of music of different genres. So I just obviously get asked to make electronic break beat driven stuff, I suppose. And then uh, this guy pays me 1600 bucks a track to do that. But I think he gets paid about three grand from Facebook. So yeah. he gives me half basically and doesn't really do anything. He just middlemans it. The standard government contracting in the US. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he he learned it well. Yeah. So trying to circumvent that at the moment. That'd be <laughs> if anyone at Facebook is listening, hit me up. 
Yeah, I used to work for a uh, I used to work for a boutique uh, pen testing firm. Pen testing means penetration testing, right? So like, oh yeah, I've heard this term. This is kind of like white hat shit too, right? Like white yeah. hats will do pen testing, right? That's exactly it. Like, okay. I mean, what different white hats do is like it's up to their skill set, right? But pen testing was kind of like the way I got formally into the like the white hat security world. And to your point, like I know how much I was being paid. I know how much the company, the boutique company I was working for was being paid. Mm. I later found out how much the prime contractor on that contract, meaning the company that had the main relationship, the manager of the contract was getting paid. And I would like to think I was getting a decent wage Mm -hmm. out of that. And then I found out that the prime contractor was billing something like four or five X what I was being paid. Right. Wait, they which, weren't doing anything. They weren't doing squat. Yeah. That's literally like how upper management and middle management shit works, right? It's like skimmers. Yeah. That's your tax <laughs> dollars. Like if you're in the United States, that's your tax dollars at work. Like, right. like they'll end up paying something like, I don't know numbers, but like these days it's, it's some fierce, like multi hundred, like, like well into, in, in some cases, Actually, best example, company gets hacked. They invite like specialists that help find out and clean up and do the forensics, kind of do the investigation, like find out, hey, what happened? And that bill rate, depending on the company, can easily be anywhere from like 900 to 1000 to like $1,200 an hour. Um, and they'll still send that stuff down to like little independent boutique contractors to do some of the work. A lot of that money gets like, this is cream. Like they just keep it. You're saying like... um. A company like let's say google gets hacked they probably wouldn't even need to hire extra pen testers they probably just have them all in house at this point right but google's security team is massive they can do that investigation on their own if they hire yeah. somebody from the outside they're doing it mostly to have like an independent look okay yeah um, okay well let's say just like company x like whoever yeah. the fuck it is and they're big and they have money but they don't have a security team they get hacked or they have a small security team yeah and they get hacked and then they hit up say a company that you or a contractor of, and they're like, here's a thousand dollars an hour to figure out how we got hacked. Yeah. And then you would hire like a bunch of smaller independent pen testers and give them like a hundred bucks each an hour, but you would be doing nothing and probably keeping like, you know, 500 of that per hour. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and here's where some of that goes, right? I don't, I want to keep this from getting like unnecessarily technical. Um, but a good chunk of that is going to go towards ensuring the answer. Like, let's say I'm one of these companies that's running the investigation, Mm -hmm. a good chunk of that money goes towards me getting the insurance that I need to say, Hey, I did the appropriate work for you. Like I did like my answer is reputable. So a whole bunch of that money ends up just going straight to some insurance company that covers Mm -hmm. that, that essentially says, Hey, I'm giving you the right answer. Mm -hmm. And then some small fraction of the rest of it actually goes towards paying the professionals that do the work. Right. Um, and, and you see this pattern everywhere, by the way. So I wonder if that's what's going on with, um, with old mate who, uh, oh yeah, by the way, in Australia, like you can refer to anyone as old mate. <laughs> Literally, it makes sense for anyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what about a baby? Yeah. What, if there was like a one month old baby, would you be like, oh, hi, old mate? He's like a young old I mate. I think you have to be at least like <laughs> 18. Oh, okay. oh, wow. That's like not anybody like. <laughs> no you know what you could probably be a baby <laughs> yeah you just see like a newborn baby like oh mate yeah <laughs> um yeah but i wonder if uh that's what that dude paying me to do the facebook shit is doing like getting a bunch of insurance and like he has a bunch of overheads for other shit and, uh, like what would he even insure against like yeah. insurance against the tune not slapping hard enough <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i've got a uh, anti-slapping insurance <laughs> yeah <laughs> Like I've got a great example. I've got a friend of mine that works um, that does like failure analysis on batteries, um, and he was lightly involved uh, in some of the reconstruction of what happened with like the Note Seven, right? Mm-hmm. And the the team uh, they were the ones that were like exploding on planes, right? Yeah. So your buddy fixed it. Um, he was in, so there were a lot of people. So Samsung ended up contracting, like they went out to like three different teams and said, Hey, look into what happened here. Like we need somebody to really give us a dead on right answer mm-hmm. so that this doesn't repeat itself. And your, your buddy was one of the people in a team of many to figure out why Samsung's batteries were exploding. Yeah. And, and, Fuck. and like the company that he was working for, 
had to like ensure the results like to the gills just oh, yeah. to make sure like because if they got it wrong and then yeah then they're more samsung yeah like samsung ends up coming out and then coming out with like a new phone mm. and then it turns out the problem is still there um and and they look at the analysis from said company and it oh wow the company got it wrong well like that company is gonna be sunk dude so my buddy au5 has or had at least a macbook where the bottom of it was like ballooned out like a football. Yeah. And like, if you put it on a table, it would just like roll around and shit. <laughs> and I was like, dude, what the fuck is going on with your laptop? He's like, oh yeah, the battery is just like mad fucking like bloated for some reason. Yeah. And it just like didn't bother him. He was still just using it and like didn't give a fuck. You know, it's, it's interesting because in our world, I, I have obscene amounts of knowledge about things that just don't make sense. Um, but tying this back to some, like some of the stuff that we do, you're seeing more and more hackers that are trying to find ways to make physical systems fail. Like, oh, interesting. That, uh, so, that would that be um, under the uh, umbrella of hardware hacking? Yeah, I mean, it, it, in some ways, right? Like, um, uh, there there are some pretty notable cases of um, uh, of uh, governments uh, finding finding ways of making entire hardware systems fail. For instance, to shut down a uh, a specific country's nuclear program. Right. Um, uh, and, and you'll see other countries that'll like take out power circuits. Um, like that's one of the biggest worries in the U S right now is like, Hey, are, are, are power networks secure against, um, doesn't matter what kind of hacker is it secure against somebody who breaks in and finds out how to disable, uh, disable, like, let's say, um, the electronic, like the, the routing of power, things like that. That's not my expertise, but I think, um, you know, I actually have some proof peripheral knowledge of this because i review talks for defcon which yeah. is one of the biggest uh hacking conventions at least in the united states every year in las vegas and uh we get tons of submissions that are about like like control system hacking and yeah. such and i always find them kind of far-fetched because like my general impression is a lot of these systems are very antiquated and don't have like secure protocols and are actually like not that hard to hack, which makes me feel really nervous about, you know, basic stuff that we need, such as electricity. So and, let's actually talk about that for a second. Yeah. Um, the the amount, the, the, the sheer number of things going on that people just have no clue are utterly fragile. Um, it, case in point, hospitals are they are so thin on margins um it, like we all look at hospitals and we all look at our healthcare system in the u.s the rest of the world is much better in this regard uh, but in the u.s the healthcare system is utterly screwed up um and people are thinking oh these hospitals are raking in cash hospitals are floating on the thinnest of margins there's a good podcast about this called an arm and a leg yeah they literally have like i want to say like 20 or 30 episodes of just like yeah, how the medical system works and like how the with an angle of like the economics of it i've listened to a bunch of them it's pretty interesting yeah it's completely broken i mean my background um and i know a few people like this wouldn't really be hard to figure out you google my name you'll probably end up finding out i used to work at a healthcare company mm -hmm. um and uh the the downside to all this is we're all thinking that healthcare is secure that all this data is is hyper protected yeah, if you're one of those middleman companies that helps a hospital, you probably do a much better job of protecting all the information that, you know, that the hot, that, that all the medical, medical information that you care about. But if you're a hospital, so many hospitals, I can't speak to the ones outside the U.S., but the ones inside the U.S. have absurdly small security teams, if any at all. Like you might have a, you might have a one building hospital, like a hospital is just one location and they don't even have a dedicated security person. They're just using IT people that might know something about how to secure stuff. The entire, all these systems, like power, healthcare, um, uh, utilities, hell, the election system in the US, um, mm. it's all so hideously fragile, which if you're listening to this and you want to uh, get into security, um, especially if you're somebody who's not like a white dude, um, like, like, please dive in because we need talent. We need hackers like so, so badly. Well, right. we, yeah, specifically we need people to do like unglamorous jobs, right? Because a lot of, you know, hack uh, technically proficient people are like, oh, I want to work on 
interest in cryptography and like new problems and such and not many people are like oh i want to just like go to a hospital and upgrade windows 7 <laughs> all day <laughs> yeah well that seems like a bit menial and you could probably get like someone who's done a certificate one at tafe and computer stuff to go and do that right um yeah i mean i think it's more that like there are a lot of there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there right like if people would just do security like up to accept security updates more promptly um a lot of things would be better but yeah well so jan how do we teach people to like well i don't want to say teach but how do we sell the idea that security is important to like the lay person i honestly i you know i used to just think like you know you could do enough outreach and education to teach people about this and now i'm like you should just automate it right like you should just make every operating system do security updates automatically unless someone turns that off and of course, that means like you can't have security updates break anything, which is like the main reason people don't do it is because they're afraid like an update will break something that they use. So what, what would you tell, like, say, just the people listening to this podcast, which I think at this point is maybe like between two and five hundred people <laughs> to do to just like uh, secure their system a little bit more? Uh, I mean, the biggest one I would tell people to do is do is use a password manager. Yes. A lot of people I've seen, especially like in the music scene, just have really shitty passwords and yeah. they just remember them. And Conti writes all of his in a book. That's actually not the worst idea. I mean, like <laughs> anything was really better than just keeping them in your head. Right. Yeah. Cause then they're <laughs> going to be simple and probably repetitive. Yeah. So I really like one password. Um, I think it costs like $3 a month, but I think it's worth it. What would you suggest? So Dion took the best one. Um, password manager is huge for sure. Yeah. That's, that's just colossally huge. Um, there are there's something that we call multi-factor authentication. Um, if we're going to make this simple, it's when you sign in with your username and password yeah, in your website. Kind of like sends a number to your phone or something. Yeah, it can send a number to your phone. I'd say if a company only gives you that option, um, I don't want to go so far as to say don't use it. Um, but if that's one option and the other option is, oh, hey, like download this app onto your phone and press a button to sign in when that app gives you the notification, like, uh, like Authy or Google yes. Authenticator or something. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, like use that. Right. Um, and that's mostly just because like, if you combine these two, you use a password manager and you use, um, that second layer. Like that's, and then like maybe like a third factor, like a YubiKey or some shit. I don't know if you actually need to go that far, but you could use a YubiKey as a second factor. Right? right. So the idea is, hey, I've got a password to something in my head. And this, the other thing is some other component, like something that I am, like a fingerprint, right? Um, or something that I have. Um, but what you're seeing more and more companies do is they're going in the direction of convenience. Um, and so what these companies will do is they'll say, oh, you can sign in with your fingerprint on your phone. You don't have to use... Uh, you don't have to type in a password. And the catch there is that your fingerprint alone, that's no different than like your username, really. You're leaving your right, fingerprints yeah. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and there's been at least one court ruling. I'm thinking of one out of Virginia Beach, I think, uh, in the US. And I think there were a few good overseas court rulings too that have said, no, like if you leave your fingerprints around, like that's fair game. Um, but if it's a password, especially in the U S you have this concept of data in your head, you can't be forced to tell it to people. It's like your fifth amendment, right? At least in the U S. Um, if it's a password, then, you know, it, it's, it's a password. You can't be compelled to give it up. Um, and so that's where it's like, okay, even though Google's coming out and like Apple's coming out and all these guys are coming out and saying, let's make it easier to get into your phone. If you're really concerned about security, it behooves you like it kind of it really is important to have a password a good strong password on your phone right yeah yeah and that's actually something that was really interesting to me i l i learned this at EFF that um passwords and other things like you know are legally different than uh biometrics which are like things you have so like under the 5th amendment or whatever it's uh like you can be compelled to provide biometric data like your fingerprint or like your face id uh, your face for your face id but you can't be compelled to provide a password so this is why um some people when they go through airport security just disable biometrics on their 
headphones. So there's I actually do this because there's uh, a, a like on iPhone, there's a shortcut. I think you hold like volume up and power uh, at the same time. So that means like if you go through in the TSA, like let us into your phone. Yeah, you can be like, I plead the Fifth Amendment. Yeah, um, and they if, can't just be like, touch your fingerprint here. Well, they can. So that's the difference between fingerprints and passwords is that... Um, well, if, yeah, they can, but then it like wouldn't work if you turned it off. But if you didn't turn that off, they would be able to get into your phone because they technically would be able to ask you to do that to get into your phone. I think so, yeah. I think this is kind of, Well, again, like neither of us are lawyers, but my understanding is that there's a stronger... Pr- there's stronger protection for legally for uh, your password than for your fingerprint. That's so, fucking bizarre. Yeah, so that's why I always turn off uh, biometrics when I go through customs. <laughs> and and there's Security. an interesting thing. I can't speak for the legal details here. Again, none of us are lawyers, right? But um, if you... I was actually going to demonstrate this on, on Bill's phone, um, but I don't actually know if you have biometrics set up on your phone. So. I do it with my fingerprint. Nice. Um, so I want to actually see... Um, if I actually hold, right, so Bryant is holding my phone. Yeah. Um, okay. So this feature is not enabled on his phone, but it is on mine and I have no idea what I did with my phone. So that's okay. It's not that big a deal. Right. Um, you mean like the face ID thing where you can just hold the phone up to someone's face and, um, but what I was getting to is you can actually, there's a feature in the latest version of Android, um, that Apple has had for some time where once you turn it on, if you hold the power button, it adds a fourth option on your Android phone that lets you put it into something like lockdown mode. Um, And once you hit that, the next time you sign in, it has to be with a password. But the way they, the way they made it show up on the screen is it'll just say something like for security reasons, you have to sign in with your password. I get that all the time on my phone and I have no idea. It seems arbitrary when it happens, but maybe it's something I'm pressing. So the reason why, if I remember right, the reason why they do it is they're, it's something called fuzzing. Like essentially they're well, not that technical fuzzing fuzzing has multiple definitions, but um, they essentially intersperse or like disperse random occurrences of that screen where for security reasons, you still have to type in your password. They spray that in there randomly so that you as a user of your phone, if you have that lockdown mode enabled, you'll get the exact same message. You can then plausibly say, I don't know, like it's that, like I don't have biometrics, uh, So that's why that's there. So when you see multiple, like if you ever see that prompt um, where uh, it says for security reasons, you got to type in your password, you can't just use your thumbprint or whatever. Um, That's, if I remember right, partly so that if you have that feature turned on on your phone, you have that kind of plausible deniability to say, like, no, I always type in my password. Uh, Okay, interesting. Speaking of terms like buzzing, what's that term called where like, you can figure out who somebody is on the internet based on like the amount of pixels in their screen. Oh, you mean like canvas fingerprinting? Yeah. Or fingerprinting in general. So that's an interesting thing that I didn't know about until recently from hanging out with you is uh, like when you go to a website, they can take information about you, like the amount of pixels in your screen and the sound card plugged into your computer and things like that. Mm -hmm, And then kind of decide who you are based on that information. Yeah. I mean, this is... um it's kind of something I think about a lot because Brave tries to prevent people from being tracked online. And so the obvious way is, you know, blocking cookies. But um, beyond cookies, there's like a bunch of other ways people can be uniquely identified um, just based on what kind of computer they're using, like the details of their graphics card and sound card. Uh, so, for instance, Bill has like a pretty sweet studio setup with like a big monitor and like a nice sound card and stuff. And so like that probably makes him pretty unique i think because like very few like websites can actually figure out like your screen resolution and they can figure out like some details about your sound setup and probably like your graphics card and stuff too so So especially if you have like a custom built pc that like leaves you even sort of more unique because the combination of stuff that you have bought for that pc is probably a more unique combo right yeah definitely so how would they do it with like a macbook because macbooks are all pretty much the same thing yeah, I mean, there are some differences between people's Macs. So, for instance, one example is websites can see what fonts you have installed. And sometimes, like, if you're a graphic designer, you'll have a lot more, like, custom fonts and such. Um, yeah, but I would say, like, if you're just using a standard out-of-the-box MacBook, that out-of-the-box Mac or whatever, that would be less identifiable than having, like, a huge monitor and, like, a bunch of custom stuff attached but yeah i think it's pretty scary that you know this websites can figure out this stuff um and use that to track you 
I think you can also use um, you can also use other tricks such as let's say you're not even let's say you're not an ad provider like you're not getting that information from somebody's browser let's say you're in a different context like let's say you're the internet company like the service provider that helps you connect online um, you can pretty reliably tell um, which person is uh, using a particular machine or is connecting from a certain IP just based on what websites they hit in like what span of time because you, you log into work right you walk to work you like you sign into your you sign into your work machine you probably have a routine of specific sites you're probably going to hit throughout the day right right and then it can kind of build a profile of like yeah. what sites you hit at what times generally yeah. and that kind of stuff yeah and it doesn't really matter so much where you sit so i mean okay your connection is sec- your connection to your bank is secure right but most people can still t- like most Internet providers can still tell that you connected to a certain bank, as mm-hmm. an example. Um, and you're starting to see a trend. It's an interesting conversation, actually, um, towards protecting that record, uh, like like that that record that you connected to a certain website, mm-hmm. um, using a new technology, a new version of, hey, tell me where this website is on the Internet, um, in such a way where uh, that Internet provider can't actually tell that you visited that website. Um, so there's a company that's very much behind the scenes of most of what people see online. They're called Cloudflare. Um, and they're working together with Firefox and I think a few other browsers, um, to implement, it's a very technical term, but implement something called DNS over HTTP or HTTPS. And if you use this feature in Firefox and I would presume any other browsers that implement it and you, um, point your DNS to like literally one dot one dot one dot one what what is dns um it's the it's the naming structure of the entire internet okay like that's this is the system that says oh hey this website like google.com it visits this numeric address this ip address and that's one of the backbones of how the internet works okay but your internet provider can easily tell right now what websites you're hitting if you're just hey i connected to because it can just get those numbers yeah I mean, it's going to keep track of it. Um, and so there are so many companies that are just way behind the scenes of what all the, like all lay people see um, that are trying to make this more secure um, and keep certain companies from just harvesting your data. Um, I don't know, Jan, how much like you're on Brave. I don't know what um, what you guys have done uh, so far around yeah, like, DNS, securing DNS. Do a lot to solve this. We don't do, so yeah, people often ask us for this. We don't, do anything super special right now so chrome is actually enabling this experiment for some users to use uh, dns over https when available like brian said and i think we're just gonna like jump on board and maybe try to like enable that for all users and does that mean if you say type in google.com into the browser it'll just redirect you to a number in the address bar rather than a Uh, https no so as a user it would actually be pretty invisible to you like you would still type in google.com and google would come up like you basically wouldn't notice this but the difference would be that like if i'm sitting on your wi-fi network and i'm trying to like snoop on what kind of sites you're visiting i wouldn't be able to see that you're visiting google.com uh and currently the way that brave is set up is or any browser any browser yeah, oh, right, much. Okay. yeah it's like currently the way most computers are set up like you like when you go to a website um your internet service provider or other people on the same network can see like what site you're visiting because of the dns requests right yeah so one thing that brave does is https upgrades um yeah. and something i didn't know before hanging out with you a bunch is that http is massively insecure yeah so http means that uh not only can people see that you're going to let's say google.com but they can also see that like what you're searching for on google.com so basically like everything that your browser is showing that's over http like an attacker could see and how difficult is it to say if you were visiting a http site how Mm -hmm. difficult would it be for me to sit between you and the http site uh well well, one way is called arp spoofing where you uh pretend to be the router because like you know your computer goes to the router and then the router goes to like the broader internet but there's no way your computer like authenticates what is and isn't the router so if i put my laptop up and i just pretend to be the router and i broadcast that like hey, you guys, connect through me, I'm the router. Then, like, other computers will connect to me 
And then I'll forward that onto the router so that, you know, you'll get requests from Google and such, but I'll be in the middle now and I can see what's going through. Right. And with yeah. uh, Brave, if uh, you go to the unsecured or the insecure version of the website, which is just HTTP, it will just automatically upgrade to HTTPS? Yeah, it'll try to do that when available. So this was a thing. This was a project we started at EFF like many years ago called HTTPS Everywhere, um, where we noticed that like a lot of sites do support HTTPS, which is the secure version of HTTP, but they don't automatically like redirect to HTTPS. So this uh, the HTTPS Everywhere started as like a Chrome and Firefox browser extension, which would automatically upgrade to HTTPS when right. possible. And in Brave, it's just like a default. Yeah, so it's on by default. I think it breaks very little, so most people just keep it on. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I leave it on for sure. But you so, actually found an interesting bug in Ableton the I other did. day. I, <laughs> you I found an Ableton it. bug. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So the Ableton bug that I found was um, in Ableton, you can create what's called a lesson, yeah. which I do for all of my project files on my website. So what happens is when somebody downloads a project file from my website and opens the Ableton project, it opens a bar on the side of the project file saying like, hey, welcome to MrBillsTunes.com project file. If you want more project files, go to MrBillsTunes.com and then right. here's a link to every plugin used in this project file. Um, but all the links like MrBillsTunes.com or all of the plugins or whatever had to be they have to be http links like you can't yeah. in the text file for the lesson thing that shows up put https links or if you click them it'll just say failed to resolve the link um for whatever reason so like for the longest time i was just doing these lesson files and just um putting http links instead of https because they wouldn't work and i didn't even realize that that was like a bad thing until hanging out with yana bunch and then the other day i was cleaning up a project file for my website and then realized that was the case and i was like oh fuck <laughs> and then emailed um one of the guys from ableton and he was like oh yeah nice we'll fix it nice that's actually more responsive than what most teams will do um most uh well many companies are getting better about it but so um yeah, check me on this. Um, wasn't the EFF also a, a pretty big backer, if not one of the like founding backers of Let's Encrypt? Yeah, so um, Let's Encrypt is kind of a joint project between EFF, uh, Mozilla, and University of Michigan, I want to say. So Let's Encrypt <clears throat> kind of came out of, I don't know how many people remember this, because you know this was like all of four years ago, but right. it used to be that most sites did not use HTTPS, and HTTP would be the default. And, and we, when we went and talked to website owners and we're like, why don't you support HTTPS? They would say like, oh, well, you have to buy a certificate and that costs like $10 a year and we don't want to pay that. So Let's Encrypt is this nonprofit that um, gives out free HTTPS certificates. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so that's helped, definitely helped with uh, increasing adoption of HTTPS over the right. last couple of years. So you basically, um, or Let's Encrypt basically got like people to invest money and then just like bought a shitload of certificates and then was like, here's a bunch of certificates, take these. Um, not quite, but uh, I mean, practically, yes. But actually what they did was they, uh, they own what's called an intermediate certificate authority, which is this entity that can like sign people's certificates. Mm. So because they own this and... I mean, they definitely have some operational costs, which are covered by donations. But because they have an intermediate, they can just sign valid certificates for people. They just made a certificate generator. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that makes sense. So talking about certificates, uh, this is a concept that I found. It's such an interesting mathematical concept. Uh, there's so much math that goes into securing everything that you do online. But Let's Encrypt simplified it to the point where um, you just run a tool, right? Like on the machine, on the computer that's hosting your website, you like you can run a tool um, that then automatically does all this work for you through the uh, through the mechanism that Jan just described, and it does it all in the background. It does it for free, and the end result of this is that it's something like we've gone from like twenty percent. I don't know the numbers, but something from like twenty percent oh, of yeah. websites secured I online. I saw your tweet about this the yeah. other day. Like yeah, 80? I saw the other day that like since 2013, the proportions have inverted. Like it yeah. used to be like 20% encrypted and now it's 20% unencrypted. That's awesome. Yeah. That's an amazing gain. And like there were yeah. sites like CNN that for as an example, um, would never encrypt anything. Right. Um, that, which is like insane because anyone going to CNN, which is probably like a pretty heavily visited website. Yeah. 
people would just be able to spoof them and pretend to be their router. They could. I mean, it's uh, like, and those attacks in, in, it's not even really an attack. Like that's, it's, I mean, it is, but it, it's done in practice in the most invisible ways to most people. Let's say you sign on to like a public Wi-Fi, right? Um, public Wi-Fi will look at the first page you visit. And if you don't have access to like, if you haven't paid for that access or whatever, it'd say, oh, you're not supposed to go to this website um, and it'll redirect you. But if you try and visit uh, via, like there are some networks that are still broken in this way because they were expecting an insecure connection. They would intercept that insecure connection and show you the payment page to log into that Wi-Fi network. But now so many pages are encrypted already that odds are if you're on this like public Wi-Fi network and you visit like a website, um, you might not even get the payment page. You might just be like stranded and not be able to actually gain access to the internet because you can't click the little box. So browser makers um, actually have a workaround for this where they try to tell if you're on a paid Wi-Fi network or one of those like open Wi-Fi networks um, because so many people made this assumption that the web was just insecure. And here's the thing. Most people would think, okay, as an example, let's say you're talking about lesson files. Well, who cares if you secure a lesson that you download? Well, here's the thing is like people going into those lessons will then be clicking the HTTP link to right. get to the website, which is at this point, mostly most, I checked a bunch of them and they were mostly getting redirected to the secure version of the site right. anyway. But like, um, in some cases, like some small old plugin companies that made plugins in like, you know, the mid two thousands and I'm still using some fucking weird version of it yeah. or something those websites probably aren't secure, you know? So it's like, yeah, not that there'd be anything of interest really to see there. If you stood behind between someone and, and at one of those websites, all, all they would be going there for is probably to download the plugin anyway, but. Well, so let's, let's dial up the fear factor a little bit. So I live, I live near DC, right? Um, and in the past when it was 20% of websites were secure, 80% were insecure. Um, what would happen was, Okay, even on your cell phone, you'd visit a website, right? And it was, let's say, not secured. And you're thinking, oh, that's okay. It's secure through the cell network. Well, that's all that's all horseshit, right? Like even today, because right now you've got all over DC, you've got these devices called Stingrays that are intercepting all your traffic um, because they're pretending to be cell phone towers. Um, every year that, that like Jan and I go to DEF CON, um, people will set up their own Stingrays just for fun. Uh, are these called pineapples? They, I don't know if... I think a pineapple, you're thinking of like a Wi-Fi pineapple, which uh-huh. is yeah. like a mostly a Wi-Fi interceptor. But these are like cell yeah. cell network interceptors. Oh, yes. wow. So even when you're not on Wi-Fi, but just like on data on your yeah. phone, these can intercept. Interesting. Yeah, they just pretend to be cell towers. Yeah. Like Fuck. So like, uh, okay, so like DEF CON is like a giant hacking conference that happens in Vegas that you pick and review talks for. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> And yeah, it's a bit and Zebler and Candy Experience plays. That's important. Right. That is important. <laughs> we need to get you to play at DEF CON. Uh, <laughs> next year. Hopefully next year. Yeah. <clears throat> that needs to happen. I would like to play at DEF CON. That would be cool. That would also be the first time I will, will have ever played in Vegas. That would be sick. Yeah, I've never played in Vegas before. Yeah. Would you do a Vegas residency? I don't think I would. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> unless I was getting paid like marshmallow dollars, which is... <laughs> Which sounds like some shit you'd buy at like a fun a park or store. something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hook, hook me up with your marshmallow dollars. But I think he gets like five mil a set or something. And he, Insane. or some shit like that. I heard some, I've heard a bunch of numbers, but he, he gets paid like an just un, unreal amount of money to play every week there or every couple of weeks or something. My issue with it is like, if you're playing, like, I don't know if people they're doing residencies are just doing the same set over and over again. or They probably do. Yeah, because my I got offered a residency once in Boulder, and Anand and I talked about it a bit, and I was like, I just don't see that really making any sense because like I write music not quick enough to have it be fresh all the time, and I just don't really dig or collect music enough to because I'm not like a full time DJ. I'm like somewhere in between a producer and a DJ. So generally, the way I work is like I'll play cities like once a year. So like I'll play Melbourne every year, for instance. Or I'll play Denver like a couple of times a year. Or I'll play like San Francisco once or twice a year or something like that. And by the time I come around the next time, because it's like eight to 12 months later, my set has pretty much all been recycled and changed. Um, but to do that 
every week. Like if you see me the next week, like for instance, you see yeah. me in DC the other day and then you saw me in Melbourne and what was the, the difference between those two shows? Like three yeah. or four weeks, something like that. Yeah, the set wasn't that different. It was there like, were some differences though. Yeah. Like you had some pretty cool new there shit. There was some. Yeah, there was some differences, but like I wouldn't like justify that as enough difference for this the same amount of like the, the same people to come and see me the next week. But I guess that's the thing in Vegas, right? Is like the crowd there kind of is constantly siphoning yeah. through because of like it's yeah, like a tourist like no attraction. Lives. Everyone's going there. Well, I mean, people do live. <laughs> I want to say Steve people, Aoki lives there. Yeah, yeah, no, people definitely do live in Vegas. But I think the the thing is, it's it's a tourist city. So like yeah. every time you would play to a completely different crowd, kind of makes sense. Yeah. Like people go there. So it's like instead of you flying around the world <laughs> to different crowds, yeah, it's like a reverse of, tour. <laughs> yeah, that's actually that's a great yeah, way to put it. I've never thought about that. <laughs> um, in that case, yeah, fuck it, I'll do a Vegas residency. I guess if, if I knew the crowd was going to be different all the time, I think yeah. it honestly would be because. Like, I don't know, like, we've all spent pretty significant time there, but... Yeah. Like, my take on Vegas was initially, like, the first time I went to DEF CON, I was like, I hate this. It's like... It was uh, garbage. It's, it's garbage. Like, it's so... It's full of trash people just, like, gambling, and it's like, you can't walk anywhere because it's too hot, and it's, like, made for cars and stuff. And the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, oh, Vegas is kind of cool because it's, like, an arts and entertainment city. <laughs> You know, like most cities are not centered around the arts, but like Vegas is more so than the average American city. Totally. Have you heard about the Mormon loophole? No. Like, to oh, Vegas? yeah. Actually, you have told me about this. <laughs> so there's a but few. I haven't um, heard this though. Yeah. 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 There's a few like Mormon loopholes uh, because they're not allowed to have sex before marriage. So one Mormon loophole is uh, called floating or soaking. <laughs> That's which my is favorite where, topic. Because um, they're not allowed to have sex before marriage, right? So the dude just like puts his dick in, but like does no thrusting. And then they will just like talk about scriptures and shit whilst inserted. No, I don't really. <laughs> Brian never is like trying part. so hard to not lose his shit. I really don't want to laugh at this because like I'm trying to like be respectful and understand, but like I think this might be an urban I, legend, but I really want to believe it's true. I believe it's, it's true. So out there. And then a, a, the second one, which I found out from a Mormon like a month ago, because I was staying at his house in Utah. Um, he, and he confirmed that that people do this is they'll literally just drive from salt lake down to vegas get married fuck for like a whole weekend then get divorced and drive back up to utah that's <laughs> that's brilliant see that's that's called that's called hacking the scripture dude that's fucking absolute <laughs> that's scripture sex hacking, hacking. Right there. <laughs> yeah, scripture hacking dude moments of such hackers i like how like people try so hard to like get around scripture they just like make these like incredibly convoluted yeah it things. literally yeah literally all religious people are hackers <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's entirely true actually hold on for a second the hotel company marriott which okay so actually i think they i always pronounce them as marriott mm -hmm. and then i found out somewhere i think it was like through a hotel video that they're pronounced as marriott instead dude literally every hotel i've ever been to has a bible in it yeah I wonder if I like start putting in my like reservation notes and stuff. Like I definitely don't want a Bible in the room if they would like specifically take the Bible out for me. Would this just be like high end hotels or like a motel six would do this for you? I would guess that any hotel that has like a custom request, if the request isn't like absolutely absurd. Is it legal to take the Bible with you when you go? I don't want to be the one like to try that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that would they just be. might bill you for it. Oh, bill. oh yeah we should talk about billing people for things so this was something we learned from brian yesterday it just like blew my mind which is that like you can kind of bill anyone for anything and like some percentage of the time they'll just pay the bill because it's like better to pay it than like not. you said uh if a doctor is late to your doctor appointment you'll bill the doctor for your time yeah i've done this exactly once and in this particular case it actually worked and i i had a pretty good amount of admiration for the doctor after that um but i mean if you think about the economics of it they're just like i really don't want to deal with this yeah, yeah. so i'm just gonna pay it well, what did you bill him like 75 bucks or something yeah it was whatever it was like it was, the guy was like 15 minutes late so i would i did a quarter of my hourly rate at the time right uh so yeah <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> Build him for 15 minutes. Yeah, I should definitely... Yeah, I wonder if a Motel 6 would be bothered to bill you for that. Or, I mean, I guess they take your card for incidentals. Yeah, but I mean, at the same time, like a Motel 6, like a Motel 6 is including it so that they satisfy their, like, a specific customer base. But I would hazard a guess that a company where it's part of their fundamental mission to 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 kind of spread the religion or spread the faith like the would, marriott 
I mean, I would guess. I don't want to assume what their corporate values are. Are you are. saying it's totally cool for me to take Bibles from the Marriott front? I am not saying that. And I right, wouldn't try I'll it. take Bibles from the Marriott at your advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I had to guess, it's like if you convert somebody, then like you've fulfilled your mission. I would be willing to True. guess that some institutions might be more okay with that than others but please don't steal a bible like why would you steal a bible <laughs> what if you're just like man this book is so good i want to keep reading it <laughs> then then be a be a good person of faith and go downstairs and ask them if you can have that copy and they'll probably just say yes that's true it's a good point yeah yeah uh, all right i won't steal the bible <laughs> don't steal a bible that's that's just ratty yeah that's like bad uh or something. <laughs> bad karma yeah <laughs> uh, I will say that the last time I was in Vegas, so you mentioned that Vegas is um, is very like Jan mentioned this is very much like a center of like culture and arts. Um, I am a glutton, like a literal glutton for food, and I think that the turn like really understanding some cities and how they represent art. And this is how I've been able to appreciate Vegas more over time. Um, is that people are really just trying to scratch out a living like mm -hmm. all over. It doesn't even matter what city you go to like here in Melbourne. Like I've just been driving around mostly to learn how to drive on the left side of the road. And that's right. just freaking terrifying. <laughs> yeah. So I've, yeah, I've spent, um, so I started driving when I was 16 and I moved to America when I was 25. So I did nine years of driving on, uh, on the left side of the road. Yeah. So like, um, it's, it's also obscure as hell because like, if you're driving on the left side of the road, it's right hand drive because yeah. you're actually in the right side of the car. Right. Right. Yeah. Wait. And in, so in Australia, it's like, everything's flipped, but in like England, is it just the driver's seat? No, no, no. I think every side that drives on the left hand side of the road still does it from the right hand side. Oh, of the car. so every yeah. country like flips both. Yeah. Hmm. And I think from like a manufacturing standpoint, like people who make say Toyota Corollas or whatever, just make like a bunch on the right with yeah. right-hand drive and a bunch with left-hand drive. And also I've seen um, maybe two or three cars in my lifetime in Australia that have a sticker on the back that says left-hand drive on them. So it is actually legal to drive left-hand drive cars in Australia still, I think, but it's just not common because it would be super weird to drive on the left-hand side of the road on the left-hand side of the car. Yeah. <laughs> Because then you're not like in the middle of the road being able to see everything. You're like right. way over to the other side or something. Oh, man. You know, it's funny because as someone who's literally just now learning to drive like a normal car in a normal country. Yeah. Like I literally started learning to drive a month or two ago. Yeah. It's amazing how often you confuse the two. <laughs> I know it's like second nature for you guys, but yeah. like at least twice now I've hit. Uh, accelerate when i meant to hit the brake and yeah. bill was in a car one of those times like we were in a parking <laughs> lot outside the coffee shop nice I was like i was like just when that happens just take your feet off all the things <laughs> yeah. and just just let it slide out and just stop <laughs> yeah, yeah just coast it at that point one thing i found super hard um speaking of like which side controls are on and stuff from switching from right hand drive to left hand drive in America is when driving a manual. Yeah. Because in Australia you would be gearing with your left hand and in America you would be gearing with your right hand. But you're still pressing the clutch pedal. The clutch is still the on left. the left and stuff like that, but yeah. still just doing the gears with the other hand was yeah. kind of weird. Yeah. Well, it's all like muscle memory and shit, isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of like playing instruments too. Like after a while, it, when you first start playing an instrument like guitar or drums or something, you're like, fuck, yeah. this all feels so awkward. Then you just do it more and more and. So I, I was watching, okay, I have no music production background other than beatboxing in the shower like an idiot. Um, but I was watching Jan and Bill just like compose this just sick, sick track uh, Thanks, yesterday. Man. Appreciate it. No, seriously. Thanks. Like I, my only contribution to this thing was saying, hey, Jan and Bill, it'd be really cool if we had like a chill banger. Oh, yeah, that's true. We did make a chill banger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this thing is sick. But like I'll watch the two of them. Um, on this machine, on on Jesse's on Jesse's machine, mm -hmm. um, which by the way is very slow. Yeah, it's, <laughs> sorry Jesse. Um, and <laughs> but I'll watch Bill just ninja the hell out of yeah, the track. It's crazy. <laughs> like, oh my god, you've memorized every keyboard. It's like playing a, It's like playing an instrument. Well, for I you. think yeah, like, it's like watching yeah. someone use. I bet it's like you watching me use Vim. Yeah. It's like me watching you use Ableton. That's probably true. Yeah. I, yeah, I would like to watch you use Vim at some point. I haven't watched you use it really because you're always like just on your left. Like, Shh. Yeah. Yeah. But like, yeah, Bill is definitely like the craziest Ableton keyboard hacker I've ever seen. <laughs> Yeah, would that be hacking? Um, I mean, if you found ways of... So something Jesse mentioned um, is 
his preference for what's the tool Reaper. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, because he can just hyper customize the keyboard shortcuts yeah, and the shortcuts that he right. uses. Yeah. Um, that's, I would call that like productivity hacking or something. Like, I don't know okay. if that's a yeah. thing, but True. like he's, he's kind of really fixed up his workflow. Yeah, totally. There's a YouTube channel that I really like by a guy called Thomas Frank. Yeah. And he's literally all just about productivity hacking. He's like, yeah, you should use like this task manager. And then yeah. like at this time when you get a task, put it in your calendar. And shit. And like, yeah. He's like literally every video is just like five tips to like make your shit faster or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And, and I actually like watch them and implement some of them. So a lot of people ask me this all the time. Like a, a lot of people, I think maybe the two main questions I get asked is like why I never get stuck writing music. Yeah. Because I'm like one of the few people I think on, on the planet who just doesn't get stuck yeah. with yeah, creative I tasks. Yeah, I with that. And it's really just music I don't get stuck with. I get stuck with other creative tasks. Like if I was, actually, you know what? I don't get stuck with drawing or writing or anything like that either. I'm pretty good at just not getting stuck with shit. And and a lot of people ask me how how that is a thing. Yeah. And then the other thing people ask me a lot is how I'm fast at Ableton. Um, it seems like both are like maybe hacking related to some degree, like trying to figure out ways of thinking and, and uh, just method methodology yeah. to, to making yourself not experience like the issues that other people seem to maybe be experiencing in those areas. Right. Yeah, that's exactly degree. right. I mean, it's, you're coming up with your own, like your own method of thinking and working. You're coming up with brain shortcuts. Like what's a great yeah, example. Right. Um, have both of you seen the, um, the uh, Benedict Cumberbatch uh, Sherlock Holmes? Uh, yes, I think. <laughs> So there was like, uh, wait, is that the one with Robert Downey Jr.? No, that's the other one. Okay, I've um, seen that one. <laughs> yeah, so um, <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch is... <sighs> Sorry, I, the opposite one. The opposite one, <laughs> exactly. The, the one who's nobody can nobody can ever get their, the guy's name right. I'm pretty sure I got it wrong. Um, sorry, Benny. Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch? Um, yeah, uh, yeah like his fans right. always call him... His fans always call themselves like Cumberbitches, which I thought was an oh, interesting yeah. name. Um, ex, ex Benedict, ex Benedict, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, but there was a concept that was discussed there um, of a mind palace. Like, in, if you want to remember things and and have a much greater capacity for memory, you envision like a literal like palace, like like. Oh a, yeah, and then <clears throat> this is how. Okay, I've I've actually seen a YouTube video where people yeah. bring this guy like one dollar notes. Yeah, and he like remembers the serial numbers on them. Yeah, and they're like pretty long numbers. Yeah. And then he gives them back the ones. And then he's like, everyone I can remember the serial number for, you have to give me that one. Yeah. And he makes fucking hundreds of dollars in a day. Yeah. Because like literally what he does is yeah, envisions like a like a house. Yeah. And then he assigns every number uh um like a image. Yeah. So he's like, I don't know, like eleven is like, you know, legs and uh yeah, the number seven is like I assign an elephant to that or something like that. Cause you know, it's got like a thing that kind of looks like a trunk or yeah. something like that. And then he'll sort of be like, all right, so there was like some legs on an elephant and then I walked into the house and then there was like this urn sitting on a thing and he just like makes this scene yeah, and then just like plays back the scene in his head and then he, and then can just like sort of whilst he's walking through the mental scene kind of give yeah. numbers. I mean, he hacked character. his own mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you just have to figure out how to do that for creativity. Yeah. What I do is I try and um uh, have tricks to generate stimuli. So if I'm feeling at all stuck... I just have like go-to tricks like, oh, just render the master and run it through some plugin or like, or just open up a MIDI clip and start like, you know, layering arpeggiators next to each other or something like yeah. that. Just something to generate some form of stimuli to make my brain go like, oh, that gives me an idea. And that's why I like collaborating so much. Like I, you probably noticed every time Jan jumped on Ableton, I was like, oh, that gives me an idea. Try this. Like, cause she was generating like different stimuli that I wouldn't generate, you know? So so, so at the point, in, well, sorry, just to continue, like yeah, yeah. at the point where you don't have another collaborator in the room with you, then you have to kind of make Ableton generative to some degree to yeah. have that generate some stimuli, right? Ableton needs a button that's just like random. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. Massive has this. It has this like random, like randomize everything button and you press it and it's just like a new random sound. Yeah. Like original Massive? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's yeah, awesome. it's sick. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that could be, actually be like a good plugin idea is like, um, you open a plugin, just hit randomize. It just randomizes a bunch of crap, throws it at you, and then is like, "Do you have an ID yet?" <laughs> yeah, you just could say yes or no, yeah, and then, and then like it like, learns from that. Yeah, exactly. And then you go, "No, I don't have an ID." And then it just like throws you a bunch of shit and be like, "Do you have any ideas now?" <laughs> and it gets like more and more aggressive, <laughs> yeah, and, like, like threatening. How about now? <laughs> so we Got need to go and like yet? we need to go and give Jesse that idea because Jesse's over here. Like, I need to make plugins. Oh yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that would be actually very clever. Because, yeah, a lot of people ask me that. And I'm sure if I could just tell them something like, just get the fucking stimuli generator. Yeah. They'd be like, that sounds like a sex toy, but yes, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> sounds weird, but it works. Yeah. I don't want to be stimulated. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, oh, there's such a big intersect between like uh, between coding, hacking, and like sound. There is, but I think we've found the wall there is that... um with code there's you have the idea the end product result first yeah and then you go like all right what do i need to get to that point yeah uh and there's only a couple of smart ways to do it yeah um or efficient ways to do it with music it's never like you start with the end goal usually at least not for me what about with like the facebook ones because those ones they literally are like oh we want a song that sounds just like this then in that case i would say that's probably closer to yeah. coding yeah where it's just like make a thing like this and you're like all right well it needs x y and z components so I'll just create those components and then put them all together. So would you say that that's, um, actually, Jan, this is the perfect question for you. Would you say that that's actually reverse engineering a song? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's pretty similar. And I think yeah. Bill's really good at this, like hearing a song and just figuring out like how were all these sounds made? How do I make something like that? Honestly, I think you can also um, do a lot of work like listening exercises too. And you get way better at like separating layers and shit like that. Like I, I can hear sounds now and kind of, like in a film and there can be like a shitload of dialogue on top of it and music underneath it and i can still hear the sound uh composites like behind all of that yeah. stuff so i think and i could i couldn't do that like 10 years ago that's definitely something that you evolve over time by the way that's a really good reason to protect your hearing whenever you go oh, yeah. out to like any like any festival or anything because like higher i have no idea how i know this um, but the, the super high pitches, like frequencies that you can hear are necessary for being able to understand like a person speaking. Yeah. That's what has all the, um, the reason why is because a lot of the stuff that gives voice diction is sibilance. Yes. And if you lose your high frequencies, you can't hear sibilance. Yeah. And so yeah. you can't discern like conversations in a loud environment. And I've, I've already the run into this The first things you'll lose is s and t yeah. and t like all the stuff at like the starts of certain sounds you'll th those will go first yeah actually if you if you listen to the sounds like you can if you open it up and what is the what is the like the frequency graph feature? uh the Fourier one yeah. which i only know because jan told me like two days ago nice uh that's called spectrum in ableton yeah so like if you if you open this podcast and you actually look at like the letters or t like any of these letters being pronounced yeah, it's gonna be like higher up on the right hand side yeah it's like ultra yeah it's exactly and and you start to lose those uh, when you lose those frequencies of hearing in your ears. Um, and I've already started to run into that. Like I'll have a hard oh, time yeah, tracking totally. conversations. Yeah. But I think to some degree, um, being able to like, uh, hear layering and separation and stuff comes from like awareness too. Yeah. like a baby, for instance, has better hearing probably than an adult, yeah. but they can't define shit because they're a baby. Yeah. But, so it's like, um, there's something Bob Katz said. He's like, a. I want to say maybe in his late 60s or early 70s or something like that. He's a mastering engineer. Yeah. And um, he says his hearing's never been worse, but his awareness has never been better. Mm. And he that's still fair. thinks that he's totally capable of mastering music at that age. That's that's totally fair. That's awesome. Yeah. Because I bet he has an idea of what he's missing too. Like he knows yeah. like yeah. what like frequency ranges he's lost and he can like compensate for that. Yeah. Plus, I think at some point you get so good at metering that mm. you can and referencing too. Mm -hmm. that you can kind of just like put it all together with like all those tools available to you now. I, I think um, it's so interesting because this is something that, that you and, and like that Jan, you, Bill, myself can do me to a lesser extent. Cause again, this is not my forte. Um, but in the world of, of coding in the world of, of software engineering, we have this concept it's called machine learning. Um, and I don't, I think machine learning might not even be the right one to cover this, but like, um, there was, there's been a massive advance in, in, in software in theoretical comp sci, um, to the point where you now have tools that can let you actually split out individual sounds when you have all these sounds kind of mashed together in like one track. Um, and you can actually, for lack of a better oh, term, yeah. like Photoshop things. Oh, that's cool. The, uh, the, the stem generator, like the one. That's like. because of FFT, which I don't fully understand. I don't know if that's the one I'm thinking of. Um, I, the, I just the one that came out recently is uh, called it's called like Splitter. Yeah, it's from Deezer, and I've actually used it to like get stems out, and it's and pretty is that good. FFT based. Uh, 
probably but it's also it's definitely machine learning based in some way right it's like trained on a bunch of music yeah and um i mean like i have a pretty basic understanding of machine learning but basically like it's given a lot of music and like uh, it, it's, it knows the right answer for like what's the drums track what's the bass what's the vocals etc and then you give it a new song and they can figure out like what's what those stems are for the new song can it actually extract and allow you to edit the individual sounds uh yeah so it, you basically feed it like any music file and it generates four waves or yeah. two depending on how you set it up yeah so there's a plugin i did a tutorial on called accusonus regroover that does the same thing and when i was talking to the guy on skype and he was trying to explain it to me he was throwing around the term machine learning a lot mm -hmm. and i was like this just seems like fft i don't think there's any machine learning going on but i might be wrong yeah i don't know <laughs> probably some combination of these two things yeah yeah, but it's interesting because when you hear tools like this coming out where you can start to pick out individual sounds, um, it's the begin it's the ability to be creative is also an ability to really weaponize creativity as well. Like if the the moment you can edit something to create something that didn't exist in the past, it can also be used in a very negative context too. So deep fakes are something that Jan and I have seen kind of emerge. And it's become a very public spectacle. We had the Democratic National Committee uh, at DEF CON in Vegas this past August um, come on stage and actually demonstrate deepfakes. Well, what's a deepfake? It's um, training a computer to recreate another person's face in like on top of like an actor and right. recreating that person's face and and allowing somebody to basically say something on behalf of that person that they didn't actually say. Mm -hmm. And it started as this experiment with like nudes on the internet, like creating fake nudes right. um, for like celebrities and stuff, which by the way, I think is a form of like sexual assault right. um, because you're doing something without that person's consent. You're creating, you're creating that content without that person's consent. And also at some point um, that probably wouldn't have even been machine learning, right? At some point that would have just been Photoshop and blending and shit at some point. Yeah. But like you, but now you had this, but like Photoshop and blending would have created like something. It's like, oh, you can definitely tell where this came from. But with, with machine learning being used in this way, you now have the ability to create completely unique things. Like you can make it look like that particular person was actually in that situation. Mm -hmm. And it's just become this massive arms race with, let's say, universities trying to advance the science just because they can versus universities that are like, it's mostly universities um, that are trying to find ways of detecting it. And um, you're going to start seeing this a lot with sound as well. You now have the ability to replicate somebody's voice um, pretty effectively. Um, I talk into a microphone and if you have the right algorithm and the right voice. You can voice do this already. Yeah. There's a online thing called Liarbird. Yeah. Which is like, yeah, we were watching that Liarbird video last night. Yeah. Um, you say it gives you like sentences to say. Yeah. So it's like, you know, the man went to the store and then like, I just ate some mints or like, you know, whatever. You just say sentences. I think you have to say 50 for it to build up the initial profile. Yeah. And when you first do it, like you do the first 50 sentences, it sounds like kind of like you, but it's still a little bit robotic. But if you just keep feeding it sentences that it keeps giving you, and yeah. it will just give them to you indefinitely. And if you want to keep saying them, you can. Yeah. It'll eventually like build a pretty clean profile of your voice. Yeah, and, it's, and then you can just type into a text box like whatever you want it to say, hit generate, and it'll just generate a, an MP3 saying that. Yeah, and it's a pretty big problem in the realm of privacy. Uh, Jan's probably seen like some of the conversation that's um, that's gone around, like how you handle deep fakes and some of the privacy debates that are going on. Right. I actually think it's like a mixed uh, like blessing and a curse because on one hand, yes, like someone can make um, you know like a video, like probably based on the, just based on this podcast, someone can like take our voices and make one of us say something like super racist yeah, we're already and, be like, screwed. and be like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, Brian is racist against people or whatever. But on the other hand, like, you know, it gives everyone kind of a plausible deniability sort of thing. I mean, true. You could just be like, that wasn't me. Someone just took that and like deep faked me. Yeah. Like even if you did say something, you could be like, Oh, you know, that's just a deep fake of my voice. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And then it's like, at what point, uh, can we prove that anyone did anything or didn't do anything? It's actually a reemergence of, in, a, in an interesting way, it's a reemergence of privacy. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, I think we've chatted for like an hour and a half, which is a, a long ass time. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any, do, you, do you, both of you have any final things that you want to say? 
Uh, Jan's been a massive influence. Uh, she doesn't know this. I've actually never told her. Um, oh my God. But like, she's been. Um, so if if you ever get bored and you start googling around for some of the work that Jan's done, like you find out that she's been involved with um, like Tor and EFF mm-hmm. and all these massive projects, and and she's a bit of a prodigy and she just doesn't acknowledge it uh, mm-hmm. because she's humble as hell. Um, and I I think that having talent and like having talented people like Jan to bring more people, more hackers into this, like into the space that we're in. It's just a massive benefit. Um, I just wanted to recognize that in some public space. Cause I've never really had an opportunity to do it. Oh my God. Yeah. Please cut this part out of the podcast. <laughs> oh no, I'm leaving Dear it editor. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, if you want to follow Jan at Twitter, go to at B crypt, B C R Y P T and send all the love heart emojis. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> do it. Oh, and what's you. your, what's your Twitter? Um, mine is E G A N I S T, so it's pronounced Eganist. Eganist, um, and that's the same on Instagram too. Yeah, you go to my Instagram story, and uh, people won't be able to see it by the time this comes out because my Instagram story will have expired. But there's so many photos of you taking photos of food. Yeah, you goddamn troll. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Um, well, yeah, thanks for both coming on. That was fun. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Yeah, yeah. bye. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Bill Podcast.